regarding the use of pyrochar and hydrochar as soil amendment. Um, question is, looking, Kurt, looking into your Kurt crystal ball, what timeline do you see before pyrochar and hydrochar is used as a soil amendment in mainstream agricultural use? Well, that's, uh, that's the million dollar question for biochar. Um, when it first hit the attention of the public back in 2007, the primary emphasis at that time was all related with the carbon markets to try to improve the economics of biochar production and its application to soils. Now we're kind of left in the dilemmas. It really, it's too expensive for a widespread application. And so that's really the thing we're waiting for is overall the economics to improve. And this, I guess this is, could be directed towards Kurt or, well, any of you. What will be required for the economics to improve? Um, you know, under what scenario or scenarios will this become more cost beneficial? Changes in the economic situation will make large-scale biochar application more feasible. Well, Carol, I think Mike probably should answer yeah. that yeah. one a okay. bit more than me because he has the project in Ohio and that's a reference. Well, and, and from our standpoint, nothing really has to change other than pick a, pick a value for biochar. Um, you know, we have, we're putting a project in, in Georgia right now. Uh, we've got a project going in in the Netherlands with pig manure. Um, we're we're starting to see people that the the cost or the environmental issues associated with what they're currently doing has reached a point where they have to look for alternatives, and and we provide an alternative that's that's more economically feasible than what they're currently doing, and and I think the the big issue we have had in all that is. You know, people understand financial. People understand our purchase agreements. They understand getting contracts and going out and, and leveraging that to get funding. Uh, when you talk to a banker about biochar and they say, "What's it worth?" and "What number do you give them?" and and that's that has been probably the biggest uh, barrier to, to putting these projects in is it's having a solid number. Is that number two hundred dollars a ton? Is it four hundred dollars a ton? Is it two thousand dollars a ton? You know, just having a number, and because biochar has not been um, produced in volumes that larger contracts have been issued, then you know it's it's an emerging market, and it's it takes a while to develop that. So that's probably the biggest thing that has to change, or or the biggest thing we need to nail down to to put a lot of these projects in. We're starting to see movement because we've got several opportunities that the economics are there even with a, a questionable value for biochar, so they're moving forward. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it will it will move in leaps and bounds if we if we have a biochar number. Okay. Now what about carbon credits and using that? Would would that come into play with this? At this point in time, um, the carbon credits that you should actually get for one of these projects is a pretty large number. But you're back to you have to go in front of, and whether it's the California Air Resource Board or whoever is going to certify it that, that you're going to get paid from, uh, you've got to establish a methodology and prove that you are sequestering that amount of carbon. Right. And, and that has not... The the, uh, the anaerobic digesters, because they're producing methane, uh, they've got an established value, so it's it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, gasification or pyrolysis, you know, those types of systems, you know, we haven't gone through those battles yet. So that's a, you know, again, that's not that's not a, a hurdle that it can't be overcome, but it's going to take some time and, and money to to get the first one of those. Process. All right. Um, 
Question here, and this is for Mike. How do the capital costs of these systems you discussed compare to a digester? They're all in. They'll be, and again, depending on what you're going to do with it, uh, they should be comparable or less than a digester. Okay. The, the, the big issue is digester doesn't solve the problem. You still got a digestate to get rid of, and, and so you still got a high moisture material to do something with. And biochar offers a completely different component. You, you've got something that's, that's very easy to transport and, and very easy to sell as is without having to do any further work. I think that, that's what differentiates the two dramatically. And kind of uh, along the similar lines, I have a question asking how much of the total nitrogen in manure is lost through pyrolysis or gasification, and how does this compare with composting or anaerobic digestion? Well, digestion will keep a lot of the nitrogen. We do not. Okay. We will volatilize. We, we typically see about 20% of the original nitrogen content. You know, on the flip side of that, you know, typically what you see with manures is uh, when they, if they're using for spreading in the field, they sit for six to nine months waiting for an opportunity to put them out in the field. So a lot of that nitrogen is volatilized away while it sits. You know, if, if we're processing material, it's fairly fresh manure, we're starting off with a whole lot more nitrogen, so even at 20%, we're we'll probably probably giving them the same amount that they have in the raw manure after it sets for six months. Okay. Um, there's a question here. What type of fuel use is used for gasification when producing biochar? Is nitrogen oxide measured in the heat exhaust stream in California, especially the South Coast and San Joaquin Valley regions? Our air quality is. Um, nitrogen oxide saturated in the primary smog pollutant. Thus, such combustion systems might require best available control technologies, perhaps as low as nine parts per million. Such technology is expensive, and these added expenses are often not accounted for. Um, and it's sort of similar thing with digester engines. So is that an issue? Would that well, be an issue? Inter interestingly enough, I went out and met with the San Joaquin Valley Air Board Oh, God, it's been probably six or seven years ago. And and whoever asked that question is correct. That is their issue, is NOx emissions. Um, the better you control air going into a gasifier, the lower the oxygen or the, the air levels are inside the gasifier, the lower the NOx. Because you're you're producing carbon monoxide and you're, you're starving it for air, so you're starving the nitrogen for any oxygen to, to uh, combine with. Okay. Um, one of the things the Air Board out there was very aware of and, and, and understood, if you take manure and put it on the field, it is releasing methane. If, it, if you're spreading on the field and then it rains on it and it starts gassing, you're releasing nitrous oxide. Uh, the trucks that are hauling it out into the desert where they're dumping it is, has, have emissions. And one of the things that they... Uh, very well understood was hey, you have a certain stack emission, but what they look at is what is the overall environmental impact of putting one of these systems in? And they said, quite frankly, you may actually be uh, NOx negative because regardless of what you've got going up the stack, you are removing more NOx emissions by removing the manure from sitting in, in the in the corrals for six months and then being spread on the fields and, and all the, the current methods that they're using. So it's, I mean, it's a good question because that is an issue that has to be addressed. But we've had discussions with the, with the regulators and, and quite frankly, everywhere we've gone that we've discussed with regulators, they've been very, very receptive and very open to looking at what we're doing. All right, great, thanks. I Probably have time for one more question, and the ones we don't get to, we will um, provide written responses to and get them on the website. Uh, there's a question here, and maybe directed towards Jason, and is the charred surface of biochar ever seen as a negative in that it holds nutrients or water too tightly, making them less available to plants? Um, Kurt might be able to back me up if I, if I misspeak, but yes. 
And it really kind of depends on as we continue to gather data. So even when, when Kurt showed that slide of the, the recent, you know, just the exponential increase in literature, those are some of the things that we're continuing to go back and forth on. Because when we look at it, um, there is that possibility that it can hold water and it does, we know that there's evidence that it at times can um, not necessarily trap the nitrogen, but because of the porosity and because of the microbe interactions that are there, it can sometimes slow nitrogen mineralization. Uh, we know that those surfaces can be both hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So, um, yes, and, um, and those take place, and we're finding and getting better and better at identifying what those are so that the end user, as they're looking at it from a value-added product, can say, okay, this is a good application, this is not a good application, and here's why. So it can be, and we're learning more and more and more about that as each one of these new journal articles come out. So that's a great question, um, but yeah, absolutely. All right, thanks. Well, I just want to thank everyone uh, for attending this webcast and thank uh, our speakers again. And as we mentioned before, that this is part one of a two-part series. Next month, August 21st, we'll have another discussion on agronomic and environmental use of biochar. And there we're going to focus on some examples of it, agri actual agronomic uses and environmental uses, including microbial transport, pathogen transport through biochar amended soils, as well as uh, discussion on niche markets for biochar.